can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? This is Alina. Hi, I can hear you. Great. Anybody else? I think some of them might be muted. Yes, Alina, we can hear you well. Thank you. Oh, good. Hi, Gerhard. Thank you for doing this today. Oh, of course. Thank you, Priya. Priya is the star tonight. Thank you, Alina, for doing this. Yes. Can Thank you, you for arranging it. And can everybody see the um, PowerPoint slides that Priya has shared? Is yes. it? Yes, okay. works well. Looks good. Good, Perfect. thank you. Hi, Wendy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for arranging this. I think Wendy is muted. Yes, it seems like she's texting. So there's still uh, about 10 minutes and we're obviously waiting for folks to join mm -hmm. in. But um, just as a reminder, of course, not for Priya, but uh, for everybody else, if you can just mute yourself if you forget once she starts speaking, of course. Um, but if you forget, I have the ability to mute you on my screen. So. Um, save questions for the end. And you feel free to use the chat option to um, put down the questions that you might have if you don't want them forgotten. But I think we'll wait for the end to okay. um, take the questions. Just to be um, double sure, you see the screen with the cursor on, right? Like near the B head? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Then I have the right screen shared. Yeah, it looks fabulous. Fabulous. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for arranging this. No, oh, my pleasure. Thank I you for showing so up. I am so excited to be here. You didn't even have to leave. No, that's the best part. But I would have loved to come and visit. Hello. There will be opportunities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can anyone hear me? Yes, I do, ma'am. Hi, my, I'm Sandy. Uh, quick question. Approximately how long do you think the lecture will be tonight? Uh, I would say about 40 minutes maximum. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for joining us. Alina? Yes. This is Fernanda. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. You know, um, I am following through my phone um, and I, I cannot see the slides, but I was wondering if you, if we would have access to them after this presentation tonight. Yes, we're actually currently recording. So you will have access to the slides as well. So if you can hear Priya, at least she can, um, you can hear her talk, but the slides will be available later. Hi, today. can you hear me talk? This is Priya. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Okay, looks like I'm all set. I've uh, I have my video turned off as well. Yeah, it's it's fine, Priya. Everything's good. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes, I think I have my video turned off too. I was in the beehive, so my hair is not looking very good <laughs> from the veil. I was putting up cages. I am covered in mud, waist down. <laughs> it's that beekeeper look. Oh, yes. Exactly. I have tidied up the first half of myself. The lower half is like covered in mud. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's hidden, so. Yes. That's good. So um, we're going to wait. I'm glad everybody's here. We're going to wait for another five or six minutes. Absolutely. And then we'll um, kick off your talk. Perfect. Excellent. So last chance to grab a drink of water for everybody or anything else. Okay. Okay. 
so has the day been so far good Here in California, Priya, we're going to get some more rain, which we're pretty excited about. I wish I could send you some rain from Oregon. Mm. Oh. Mm. Today was one of the rarest sunnier days. Well, that's nice. Yeah, it, it was kind of nice today, but it's back to raining from tomorrow. We had yeah. a windstorm and a severe rainstorm on Saturday and Sunday. Wow. So that's why you're covered in mud, I yes. guess, despite the sun. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I didn't realize we were supposed to get rain tomorrow. Well, that messes with the beekeeping. Yeah, tomorrow and Wednesday. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is it already getting hotter there? I mean, I'm pretty sure it must be hotter than in Oregon. Yeah, we had, um, we're Northern California, just outside of Sacramento. Mm -hmm. It was around 70 today. It was pretty nice. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Beautiful weather. And it's dropping down. Hmm. Wow. Okay, we have more people joining us. Great. Great. Alina, do you have the list of uh, our, sp our speakers in future I webinars? I do. I do have a list. I just have to confirm them for a specific date. Ah. It will be, I think I am pretty sure I sent it in the update. Yes. So it will be um, Steve um, Grapaski from Out East. He's going to be talking about swarms. Mm -hmm. Then we have um, Mike Simone Finstrom. He's going to be talking about breeding. Mm -hmm. And then we have Laura from my own lab and she's gonna be talking about um, pathogens and viral infections and the immune system of the bees. Wow. That sounds like a very exciting lineup. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody else feels that way. Okay, we'll wait three more minutes. Sure. And I'll actually be right back. I just need to grab a glass of water. So Priya, how far into your postdoctoral research are you at the moment? I joined in November 2016. So I was actually like I did some reading and then uh, we already had another project here, which was on uh, pesticides. So I started working on that. And then I started building this nutrition project from last spring, summer. Wow. So it's just been like a year that I'm actually working here, kind of, if you look at it. Long enough to get um, up to your waist in mud, by the sounds of things, yes. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Long yeah. enough for that. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, you've got some really intriguing research. Thank you so much. And OSU is quite a leader in um, pesticides and honeybees from my understanding. They published a, a really great um, uh, reference article. Mm -hmm. Well, it's almost a booklet, really. Uh -huh. uh, yes, uh, yes. I th I'm trying to remember the woman's name. Ho Hooper? Um, Louisa Hooven? Yes, Hooven. Louisa, Louisa Hooven. Hooven. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. And we also currently have another uh, faculty member, Andoni, who's about like two years in the department. Mm -hmm. So he was hired based on uh, Oregonian legislature, like they made changes and they required a position mm -hmm. in Oregon who would, uh, I would say, uh, most importantly, focus on pesticides. So they have been trying to come up with new pesticide uh, with a new booklet as of now. Oh, wow. So an update to yes. the current booklet that yes. uh, Louisa published. Yes, correct. Which is a great resource and it is available for download at um, the OSU website. Yes. 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 So if anybody is interested in learning a little bit more about pesticides, OSU has a great publication available on their website. So we have like a very intense program going on right now also uh, under uh, Andoni's, uh, I would say, supervision. And uh, 
it it's kind of going good and hopefully they'll come up with the updated version pretty soon awesome I am so excited to be here today. <laughs> I'm excited to hear your presentation. I've seen some of the slides and um, they're quite engaging. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. So I'm looking to hear what goes along with the beauty that I'm going to see in these pictures. Thank you. We have more people joining us. Yeah. Yeah, we did. So uh, it's 7 p.m. So I mm -hmm. think um, we're, I'm just going to admit people as they show up. Okay. Um, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So we're on time because I know it's an evening and it's Monday. So I'm sure everybody's tired from starting their week. Um, <laughs> but I want to welcome Priya. Um, she is a postdoc currently at the Honey Bee Lab of Ramesh Sagili, and she's doing some really neat work with um, looking at nutrition of honeybees. And I thought that would be really interesting for you guys, although I know she's going to be talking a little bit about some of her work in India as well, which I think will be really cool too. So I'm really excited and happy that she was able to join us tonight and everybody else, obviously, who's here, who's able to join us. It's really great to have you. Um, just a reminder, once Priya starts talking, if you can mute yourselves and then keep the questions to the end, um, that would be great. And I think we're going to kick it off, um, pass it on to Priya. Thank you, Valina. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Valina, so much for organizing this. I am really excited to share some of my research with everybody today. Uh, so just like, I hope you can see the cursor. Uh, I have slides numbered to the lower right. So in because of my thick Indian accent, if anybody misses something, if you just note down the slide number, I would be happy to come back to it and talk more about it. So uh, my presentation today is a little bit about the research that I did during my PhD back in India. And I will also talk about the nutrition work that we are currently doing here in OSU. My PhD work was uh, studying the effects of uh, pesticides on native Indian honeybees. And as I move through the slides, I will show a little bit of the research and the extension work that I did during my PhD. So beekeeping in India, has been practiced since uh, hundreds of years from the ancient civilizations to the time when the Mongols, they invaded India during the British Empire, when India was new, young, as a newly independent country, as well as the modern India. Uh, it has always been the same two practices, either gathering, wild hives, as you could see the practices from the hunter-gatherers, or beekeeping using the modern techniques. So what beekeepers usually use is if you look at the lower panel, the lower two pictures, these are the typical boxes that you would find here in India. And uh, people often tend to keep Apis serrana, which is a native Indian bee, similar to the mellifera, but smaller in size comparatively. So they often tend to have Apis serrana, and some beekeepers often also practice with Apis mellifera. But other than that, there are some traditional beekeepers who use uh, dry grass for weaving it into like a cylindrical structure for keeping bees, as you can see on the lower left panel. They also use earthen pots or concrete blocks for beekeeping. So a lot of bees in India, for example, Apis serrana, like Apis mellifera, they are cavity nesters. That is, they need to find a hole, a dark, shady place to build their nests in, to build their hives in. So that is why the beekeepers also use these above three techniques to provide them the shade and the enclosed space to build a hive. 
farming in india it is an amazing experience to be able to actually travel to all these places and uh, work in close uh, proximity with the farmers and the beekeepers because farming in india is very different than you would imagine in a first world country the farmers are often very poor and they have very small plots of land not not a big size land at all and they try and practice polyculture so that they can maximize their yield and try and have as many crops as possible they often try and couple that with shrimp and fish as in polyculture they may have cattle that they keep next to their farmlands and these days some farmers are also trying to place one bee box at least in their farmland in their plot and hoping that the yield might be maximized coming to my field sites i worked in uh, a number of eastern indian states and uh, it was an adventure some of these states are uh, sorry some of my field sites are so remote that there is also no electricity and as you can see we often have visitors in our field sites like elephants poisonous snakes and i'm glad i don't have a picture to show any of you bears and tigers where you can see the nets and uh, sometimes you need to travel on these little canoes these little boats to reach your site and you can pretty much see that anything and everything travels on these the best you can do is just get up and start praying that you don't drown and die uh but not everything is you know like that adventurous sometimes these are just really serene nice pretty places and uh, i actually did take my husband back to one of my field sites after my phd was complete because i still could not get enough of that place so it has been like a mixed adventure working in these field sites and uh, as and more that i went deeply into research i realized how different uh i would say i worked in europe i worked in india and now i'm working in the us and as i'm gaining more experience i see how these subtle changes in the society are kind of like unique to every region that i worked in so these are the two focal species that i worked on during my phd the picture to your left is apis dorsata they are the giant those huge indian rock bees and you can see that they built these massive hives which hang from the tree branches and to the right i have apis serrana which are very similar to mellifera they are grown in boxes or in tree tea, or in uh, tree cavities but uh, they are slightly smaller than mellifera so these are the two uh, native indian honey bees that i worked on I just wanted to show you three more different types of bees that are of commercial interest in India. To the left is Apis mellifera, as uh, you can probably recognize. In the middle, we have Apis florea. It is our uh, Indian dwarf bee, and they also produce honey. So it is of some commercial interest for sure in India. And to the right, it is not a honey bee; it's a stingless bee, but it produces honey. and some people also cultivate them these bees they grow in uh, tree hollows or in cavities and some people also maintain them in hives very similar to as you would for apis mellifera and they are also of commercial interest for the honey that they produce so coming back to my research during uh, my phd days these are the two eastern indian states that i worked on as you can see i've highlighted them uh, in each of the states i have eventually designated one site as my control site with no pesticide and the other site as my pesticide zone i have designated them as lic or my control site low intensity cropping area and hic as my pesticide zone with the high intensity cropping area sites uh this took me about a good year year and a half to actually establish my field sites i had to conduct extensive farmer surveys this took months in the two states the regions that we decided that could potentially work as our field sites we had to then go to each of these individual places 
and I had to conduct extensive farmer surveys, beekeeper surveys, to figure out what was their practice of uh, and their use of pesticides, both quantities and types. I also collected uh, the cropping intensity data sets from the government ag offices. I collected pesticide, I collected honeybees and soil samples from these regions and I tested them for pesticide residues. I also mapped their climatic data because all I wanted to differ between these sites were the pesticide intensities. They were more or less of the similar climatic profile. And I also teamed up with a geologist and we plotted these landscapes. We mapped these landscapes to be able to exactly quantify how much of the land was being used for agriculture and how much of the land was untouched. So all of these put together helped me decide on my field sites eventually. So moving on to uh, my research, when I started working on this, not much was known on the effects of pesticides from the Asian subcontinent. And hardly anything was known about what was happening to these native Indian honeybees, especially the wild populations. What people were mostly interested in was dosing bees in lab and then just showing some differences or observing what was happening. But in the field, it was a completely different scenario. There is a cocktail of pesticides, which is always being used in the field at different intensities. And it was very important for us to understand what was actually happening. And in fact, in India, neonics were not that common at that point of time. People mostly used organophosphates, organochlorides, and synthetic pyrethroids. Neonics are just seeping in. So it was really important for us to know what was happening. So I worked on these wild native bees out in the field. I also built cages in laboratory and I treated bees to pesticides to see if they showed a similar response pattern to pesticides as the field samples. This helped me kind of isolate the changes that I observed and assume that yes, indeed, these were for pesticides. So the first part of my study was to check the effect of uh, pesticides on the oxidative stress of bees. I am pretty sure that, I mean, all of us have heard about, you know, these antioxidants, be it in like face lotions or food or drinks, like, for us humans, we know that antioxidants are very important to make sure you have a healthy body. So these free radicals or these oxidants, they are basically hypercharged various versions of oxygen molecules of various forms. They, they keep roaming in your body and you need certain enzymes or certain uh, chemicals which counteract them and you call them antioxidants. So similarly in honeybees, these pesticides cause oxidative stress. And I wanted to study how much oxidative stress was being caused if indeed there was some form of oxidative stress. So I have always uh, kind of like mentioned some of my publications here. If anybody wants to go through in greater details about the research, I will mostly go very briefly through this. So what I did was uh, I studied these three enzymes they are all important antioxidant enzymes in honeybees. And uh, xanthine oxidase, in fact, I was like, we were the first ones to report it to be upregulated due to pesticide stress. And we found that these enzymes were expressed much more in populations which were treated with pesticides compared to the controls. And this helped us understand that because it was a similar response pattern, both in field and in lab, that yes, indeed, pesticides cause oxidative stress. Next, I studied the effects of these pesticides on bee behavior. I studied them for olfaction, a bee's ability to sense smell, vision for them to see, and taste, gustation. These are the three different behavioral aspects that I studied because as we all know, for a bee, it is very important that they are able to forage, bring food back to the hive. Also, their internal hive communications to manage all of their life cycle needs requires that they stay very alert when it comes to their individual behavior. The first part that I'll show you is uh, the effect of pesticides on honeybee olfaction. 
This is just a small video that I wanted to show you as to what proboscis extension reflex or PER is. It is a direct behavioral response for smell. Like the Pavlovian dog experiment, when you touch the honeybee antennae with a drop of sugar syrup, it extends its tongue, its proboscis, hoping for a sugar reward. But when you couple this sugar droplet with an odor, the honeybee after a few trials, trials, it learns to extend its proboscis just in the presence of odor alone. This is what we called PER or proboscis extension reflex. So I performed this test and we found that bees which were treated with pesticides, they did not perform as well as the control honeybees, which essentially told us that yes, there was some sort of behavioral abnormality happening in these bees. To have a better sense as to how bees smell, we know that bees are bombarded with a many different odor cues throughout the day. And the antennae are their primary receptor organs for seeping in all these odor cues. These antennae are made up of very tiny ultra microscopic structures called antennal sensilla which in turn are made up of olfactory receptor neurons. And these neurons, these nerves, transport the information to and from the honeybee brain. So what I did is I studied the honeybee antenna first to understand what was happening. This technique I used is called scanning electron microscopy, where we use a microscope which has the power to magnify 10,000, 20,000, even 30,000 times. It, you can zoom in as much as you want. As you can see, the honeybee antennae has 10 segments. And across all the 10 segments, there are about 14 types of sensilla that we observed. Just, I just wanted to show you some of some pictures. Uh, these number one and two are two different types of sensilla. And you can see that the pesticide populations have some crack-like marks which have appeared in these sensilla. Also, you can see deformation that happened. There is, a, there is like less curvature here in figure panel two. And as you can make out because of pesticides, there were definitely some form of deformities happening in these sensilla. We also found that the number of sensilla were drastically reduced in the pesticide populations compared to the control honeybees. So after having studied this, I was even more curious, like why was this happening? What else is happening? So then what I did is I decided to study the honeybee brain. The picture to your left shows you a live honeybee with the head capsule removed. And you can see a picture of the live brain. So the honeybee is live. And uh, the picture to your right gives you a line diagram of this honeybee brain. And you can see that there are two regions primarily of our interest, the mushroom body region and the antennal lobe region. They are the primary olfactor, olfactory regions of the honeybee brain. So what I did is, just to put it very briefly, these bees were live and I injected a stain mixture to stain for free calcium in these honeybee brains. So you would ask me, why free calcium of all the ions? Why suddenly our interest in free calcium? This is because we know that free calcium is primarily responsible for honeybee olfactory memory formation long-term as well as short-term, and it helps in processing olfactory memory. So after studying what was happening to the bee behavior, then to the bee ultra structure and morphology, we wanted to know what's happening to a bee's neurophysiology when it comes to olfaction. So this is what we found. I will just show you one image, uh, essentially to show that the higher the green fluorescence, more free calcium. And as you can see, the control mushroom body as well as the control antennal lobe in figure panel one and figure panel three have much higher green fluorescence compared to the pesticide honeybee brain regions which essentially indicates that there is more free calcium and hence better olfaction olfactory capabilities in these honeybees so these eventually kind of corroborated all that we found in our previous experiments with olfaction Moving on to honeybee vision, I will also show this very quickly. What I did is I trained honeybees to 
large feeder discs and i associated that training with sugar syrup which is a positive response so that the bees learn a particular color and associate it positively with a sugar reward i also constructed these custom y mazes and each of the arms had uh, either blue or the yellow color painted on it and we released bees after training to see if uh, they were able to understand sorry if they were able to memorize the color and choose the color correctly as uh, the olfaction behavior we found that bees which were treated with pesticides were, did not perform as well as the control honeybees uh, this part of my study i conducted in uh, uk i worked at uh, the institute of neuroscience in uh, newcastle university and uh, i studied the effect of pesticides on bumblebee taste perceptions gustatory perceptions so what i essentially did was i starved the bumblebee then i gave it you can see the video while i talk uh, i starved the bumblebee then i gave it different concentrations of sugar syrup with different concentrations of nunix and we wanted to see what how pesticides in food changed their taste perceptions and to our surprise we observed that um, a higher concentration of sugar syrup Ma masked the effect of pesticides in that solution which is quite relatable to the field studies because in field a sweeter nectar often masks the amount of pesticide that is present in it and such little doses eventually add up when the bee keeps bringing food back to the hive and this is what we call sublethality or sublethal toxicity for the last part of my phd research i also studied genetic diversity at both protein and dna levels in these natural honeybee populations and uh, i just wanted to show you a picture and not much of the research so what i found is that uh, the pesticide populations indeed had a slightly different dna and protein structure compared to the control populations there were some form of underlying changes happening in these populations that could be adaptive but or that could be destructive but indeed pesticide was altering the genetic makeup of these populations and i conducted the study only in the field populations because i Uh, knew that these honeybees were exposed to pesticides for generations so i wanted to know what was happening when these bees were exposed to pesticides for a long time and we found that yes there were subtle changes in their genetic makeup by studying their differential protein and dna expressions these are some of the pictures i wanted to show you i hope this is more exciting than those boring graphs or images uh, the picture where my cursor is right now to the top and bottom uh shows the inside of the flight cages that i had built and when you use an artificial flower patch like that you don't have to train the bees at all you can always add exactly the amount of pesticide you want in little vials and put them in these flowers and the bees will always come flock and forage and it was easier to treat them with pesticides where my cursor is right now this image shows you a frame of apis serrana and you can see it's a tiny frame compared to the normal apis mellifera hives that you see we also trained uh, as i said locals in helping us set up pan traps and this was part of another study uh, where we were studying the native bee diversity in these regions and this image here to the right shows the flight cages that we had constructed and you can see some dorsada bees just sitting here and probably i'm on the other end wondering what am i supposed to do with that uh as i said that we got this uh, i also did a little bit of extension work during my phd and uh, we got this massive grant from defra government of uk and as a part of it we also extended our research to other different indian states we conducted extensive farmer uh, festivals beekeeping festivals awareness programs and we distributed these flip charts these uh, calendars these pictorial guides to help them understand what pollinators are and that not all insects they see in their fields are pests some of them are also beneficial insects i am just showing you the english version of these because uh, as i said most of these people do not even have a basic education so 
to help them understand and for us to be able to reach out to them in every state that we worked in we translated all of these to the native local language so that it was easier for us us to get through to them and we added as many pictures as we possibly could so that the visual representation was strong for them to immediately see recognize and understand and these are some of the images from the farmer festivals and uh, we also distributed bee hotels to them we trained locals in how to set up tra uh, pan traps we uh, worked our way through them with these flip charts we made sure that there was a hearty lunch snack and dinner available for them so that we can encourage participation and as i said another beautiful publication came out of it where we showed that farmer and beekeeper perception can be used in acquiring indigenous knowledge so uh, moving ahead to the present research at the osu honeybee lab I am trying to develop a nutrition project where we are looking at the importance of key phytosterols in honeybee nutrition. And uh, as a uh, part of another continuing project in lab, I'm also looking at pesticide impairments in the commercial Oregonian beehives. And I'm of course working on Apis mellifera now. So our lab at OSU, we try to understand what effects pests and diseases have on bees we also want to explore nutrition as a way to make sure we have healthy hives and we also study the effects of pesticides on honeybees i will only talk about the nutrition aspect today so as we know nutrition is the first line of defense and it is key in dealing with our major problems such as pest pathogens and diseases in fact nutritional stress is an important factor for colony collapse disorder so why our sudden interest in phytosterols we know that honeybee nutrition has mostly focused on proteins amino acids for proteins sugars for carbohydrates salt mixtures to a certain extent for uh, minerals and some people have looked into fatty acids or some people have looked into omega-3 fatty acids and so on but nobody has really looked into sterols so why suddenly this importance of sterols insects including honeybees they cannot synthesize their own sterols insects are oxotrophic to sterols which essentially means that they cannot synthesize sterols in their own bodies and sterols must be provided through diets sterols are very important because they are precursors for molting hormones they are components of cellular membranes and help the cells function properly and there is a massive gap in knowledge about the sterol requirements in bees in fact when we were looking up literature we found papers from mid 1970s to early 1980s even though people are focusing on pollen nutrition but a lot of study has missed out on sterols and this is why this particular problem became equally challenging and exciting for us we know that pollens are primary source of phytosterols in honeybees in fact 24 methylene cholesterol is the key phytosterol that bees require we don't know what happened but it could be that plants had more of 24 methylene cholesterol and the bees adjusted themselves accordingly or this is the key phytosterol that the bee can actually metabolize utilize and absorb into its body so the plant started producing more of it but whatever may be the reason for coevolution we know that without a doubt 24 methylene cholesterol is a key phytosterol that honeybees require and our study focuses on 24 methylene cholesterol nurse bees have the ability to selectively transfer sterols to the larvae through brood food honeybee colonies which have access to natural pollen forage have been reported to perform much better than the commercially available diet supplements and this is what got us intrigued because we don't know for sure what these artificial diet supplements have in terms of phytosterols bees have endogenous sterols in them that is bees have sterols which are already stored in their tissues which these sterols are the sterols they take up from food and they store it in their body so that they can pass it on to the growing brood through brood food i will show you a small animation video to explain how sterols are important in honeybees as i said before pollens 
have an abundance of phytosterols in them when bees consume these phytosterols essentially what they do is along with everything that they take up they also take in sterols within their body tissues the bees are then able to transfer these sterols to the larvae to the growing brood through brood food and because of sufficient sterols we have molting hormones and the larvae grow into successive generations of adult honeybees which emerge however when some of these protein supplements they lack in these essential phytosterols especially 24 methylene cholesterol even though the honeybees are consuming it after a point they will have no external sterol source to replace their endogenous sterols and there would be no sterols for the growing larvae and as a result there would be no honeybees emerging from the hive so to understand if 24 methylene cholesterol is important and how much of it is required we had three basic questions that we asked ourselves last year all this study was performed last spring summer in 2017 so we wanted to know how much of 24 methylene cholesterol is actually required in these artificial diets we also wanted to know if it had any effect on the honeybee physiology and what happens to the whole hive so we conducted these cage studies in lab as i was saying before there is a massive gap in knowledge and we found one paper from 1980 which had conducted a similar study they formulated an artificial diet and they added 0.1% of dry diet weight of different sterols in different diets and they reported that yes 24 methylene cholesterol is a key and a vital phytosterol that honeybees require but that brought many questions to us that why 0.1% because it was not sufficiently justified in the paper so based on that paper we similarly formulated an artificial diet with proteins sugars vitamins and we added different concentrations of 24 methylene cholesterol starting from 0.1% to 1% because we wanted to know that if bees indeed had a preference for these sterols to our surprise don't be intimidated by the graphs i'll just talk about it you don't even have to look at it so essentially what i found is uh, we found that yes by addition of sterol to the diets we act, uh, we conducted the study for 3 weeks and we found that yes by addition of sterol to the diets for every week there was a higher consumption in cages which had more sterols added to the diets compared to the low or no sterol diets also survival significantly improved bees which were treated with sterols survived longer than bees which had no sterols in their diets we also found that head proteins and abdominal fats increased in bees which were treated with higher sterols in diets compared to bees which did not have any sterol in their diets so after we found these changes i grew curious as before i am really interested in knowing what happens to the bee brain and i thought if there is an increase in head proteins and an increase in abdominal fats let's see what's happening to the bee brain lipids so i stained bee heads uh, as before i've showed you i've shown you a line diagram of the bee brain and the dotted blue line is our region of interest as you can see the area marked in z is essentially how lipids when stained show show up under the microscope but our region of interest as before is antennal lobe and mushroom body marked as c and d in all of these images and as you can see these little red lipid droplets stained essentially show you how much of lipids are being retained in honeybee brain tissues and we also found that these were higher in cages which were treated with sterols having understood all of it we essentially realized that yes 0.5% is a good concentration because we see highest survival in it and also from 0.25% we start seeing these changes so what we did is answer our final question when do these endogenous sterols are replaced in the honeybee tissues because that is also an important information for us to know 
This is a typical 24 methylene cholesterol molecule. I should have mentioned before, we purchased this uh, chemical from, uh, this is a synthetic chemical that we purchased from a chemical manufacturer because we wanted to uh, be able to know exactly how much of 24 methylene cholesterol we are adding to the diet. That is why we went ahead and we purchased a synthetic 24 methylene cholesterol molecule. So this is what the typical molecule looks like. And the carbon at the 28th position, we labeled it with 13C or a stable isotope for carbon. Carbon has 12 atoms. When carbon has 13 atoms, it is called an isotope. And because it does not degrade or break down easily, it is a stable form of carbon. We call it a stable isotope. So we labeled the molecule with a C13 label 24 methylene cholesterol right here at the 28th carbon. What we did, we conducted similar cage studies in lab. We had control cages where there was no sterol in the diet. We also had cages where we added 0.25% of this particular labeled 24 methylene cholesterol to the diet. As I said before, because we found a difference from 0.25%, we decided to use only one concentration. And especially because it is extremely expensive. So whatever happens for 0.25%, we can be rest assured would also reflect in the higher concentrations. So what we found, as before, uh, bees consumed the sterile diet more than the control diet. Bees survived better in the sterile diet than the control diet. Their head proteins and abdominal lipids were higher in the sterile treated honeybees compared to the control populations. Then to answer our final questions, what we did was, we sampled bees at the end of every week for four weeks and we separated out the head, thorax and abdomens and we quantified this 13C, how much of 13C is present in head, thorax and abdomen at the end of every week. 13C as a stable structure, as and how it travels through the entire bee tissue system as part of the total 24 methylene mo cholesterol molecule or as an individual separate unit will help us understand what happens to the fate of 24 methylene cholesterol molecule in the B body over, a, over time. So this is also another complicated graph, but I'll just walk you through it. Uh, so the first block is basically head, the second block thorax, and the third block shows the data from abdomens. W1 through W4 indicate weeks one through weeks four. The blue lines are percentage 13C and the gray bars are total carbon. Let us only focus on the blue line. If you look at the head data, you see that percentage 13C is highest during week one and declines during the end of the experiment. Not much of a change in thorax, even though it increases slightly. But for abdomens, there is a sharp increase between weeks three and four. So what we essentially find, when we think about honeybee behavior and biology, young adults that we had initially started with in the cages, they are basically nurses. They have hyperactive hypopharyngeal glands and hence that is why maybe they store more of 13C in their heads during the beginning of the experiment. But as the bee ages, it progresses into a forager and its major responsibility is to store as much nutrient as it can in its body tissues to perform its foraging duties. And maybe this is why we see a sharp increase in 13C during the end of the experimental phase. And this also helps us understand that somewhere between weeks three and four, a complete endogenous sterile replacement must have happened in these bees. And this is very critical for commercial beekeepers who provide artificial supplements to these beehives so that we have kind of an estimation of the timeline as to how long we can actually stretch without providing sterols to a particular bee colony. So looking ahead, as I said, uh, this was the work that we did last year and we are expanding it in a massive scale this year in spring summer in our apiaries and we have constructed huge flight cages. That is where I was and got covered in mud but we are using the similar artificial diet. We are uh, treating nucleus hives to have an idea as to what happens to the whole colony. 
we will be checking for how the entire colony behaves to addition of sterols in their diets. And as I said before, we are using a synthetic source because we want to know what, how much of 24 methylene cholesterol we are adding and what is happening to it. But as and when we finish our study, we are also mapping sterols across crop pollens, B tissues and all. So we are trying to come up with feasible alternate solutions of using natural pollen for supplementing sterols in bee diets. And uh, we are collecting uh, crop pollens as and when we can. If any of you are interested, you can get in touch with me. If you know for sure that you have a pure pollen with you from a plant that you know of, and you would like us to expand our library of sterols and test those pollens for sterols, I will be very happy to do that. And uh, as I said before, this spring summer is completely packed running these cage studies, but I will be happy to start testing all the pollen samples that we collect from this year, fall or winter onwards. And uh, PAM and uh, California State Beekeepers Association have provided us with very generous funds to be able to conduct these large scale experiments this year. Bear with me, I have two acknowledgement slides. I would like to thank the following people. Uh, the organizations and the funding body without whom my work in PhD would not have been possible. They are extremely generous people with institutional and funding support because of which I was able to perform those studies. And as I said before, I was the only B guy in the lab. And, and a lot of protocols had to be standardized and established when I actually started working on that particular problem during my PhD. And for me to be able to solve it to a certain extent. Uh, I would also like to thank everybody here in the Honeybee Lab, Oregon State Beekeepers Association and Glory Bee for the generous funding support. Uh, this lab is incredible and we are constantly trying to solve unique problems and we are hoping that we can come up with feasible, alternate, easy solutions for beekeepers. Thank you so much for being here today, listening to my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I will take them now. Uh, I usually work here like pretty late, so I'm very slow in updating my website, but I usually try and update about my current research. So if you want, you can take a look at it or you can email me or text me or call me with uh, any questions that you may come up with later on. Please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions, but if you have any questions now, I will be happy to take them. Thank you so much. I cannot hear anybody. Thank you, Ginger. I guess I can turn my video on now. Sorry, I was muted and didn't realize it. So yes, I can hear you now. Priya, that was great. I really appreciate it. And I think um, we should, the way, instead of, because it's a little bit, we can't see each other and it might be a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. So. If you have a question, maybe type in um, your question in the chat and, or you don't even have to type in the question in the chat, but you can just say, I have a question and then I will um, call your name and then you guys can ask for your question. Perfect. Thank I'll, you, Alina. I'll, I, can I start? I'll start. Um, nothing too um, difficult, I hope but from what you've learned so far do you have any potentially recommendations like practical recommendations for beekeepers and what they should be feeding um not necessarily like specific supplements or what but mm -hmm. what should they be looking for or if they're if you do have any specific recommendations too. yes uh so from the research that i've done so far i can definitely say that addition of sterol to the diet is more important when the colony is growing. When you have brood in the colony, especially during spring, summer, it is very important to have enough sterol sources in the diet. And uh, I actually tested for almond pollen as well as I also tested at some artificial supplements. I will not name any artificial supplements, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, almond pollen has some good sources of uh, phytosterols in them. Ooh. I am also collecting other different sources of pollen, as I said before, and I'm trying to come up with like, you know, I mean, easy practical recommendations that, hey, you know, just 
buy some pollen and add it to your uh, diet. Or if you have like these plants around your beehives, they can provide the additional supplemental sources. So what about, I'm just gonna, <laughs> since we're talking about it, I'm just gonna take over. And I'm sure everybody has the same question um, or similar questions. So in terms of collecting, pollen mm -hmm. and feeding it back to the colonies. There's mm -hmm. always this discussion and question of, is it better to just give them actual pollen, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it has pesticides, because often it does have pesticides mm -hmm. in it, or should we do something, is there any way to clean it, or is there anything that you would recommend, or should it just be, I mean, obviously, if it's, you know, in almonds, I don't know if you want to. So when it comes to, uh, so when it comes to addition of pollen, we definitely have to be careful about what source the pollen is from, because as mm -hmm. I said, sublethality is a very serious question. Even tiny amounts of pesticides, they start building up very quickly when mm -hmm. you keep adding to it. Actually, just today, I read this another article from WSU, uh, an engineer, he came up with a synthetic powder which can absorb uh, pesticides from pollen to some extent, and it can be used as a powder form and I was just reading it right before the webinar so I do not have all the updated details on it but these are just some you know other versions of cool research which are coming along and I hope that it will eventually be practical and feasible but at this point testing pollen for pesticide is very expensive and it's not always feasible so for us the ideal recommendation would be to first make sure that we have an organic source or at least as pure uh, pesticide free source as we can for pollen or planting, uh, making sure we have enough natural forage where our hives are placed, which will continuously provide a natural source of pollen without us having to do the work. Yeah, that's always been a tough question, though, with all the uh, the scale of beekeeping that's happening. Exactly, absolutely. Do you, is there, do you have anything, um, and I'm just hijacking, hijacking this, mm -hmm. I hope nobody minds, but I'm sure, again, they have some more questions. Do you have any recommendations? I know, I know you're working on pollen and uh, sort of mm -hmm. protein supplements, but do you have any recommendations for sugar feeding or is there anything that you prefer or? So for sugar feeding, I mean, uh, now, for example, like as we all know, now that it's uh, spring and summer, of, I'm pretty sure like right after winter, the hives are super hungry and they are craving for sugar. But when, uh, when it's spring, summer, I think along with sugar, we should all also try and make sure that our hives have, have some source of water close by. And uh, when I treated the artificial diets, when I treated my bees with the artificial diets, I also added sugar to the diet. So that kind of formed an additional source of uh, carbohydrates for the diet. So when the colony is growing through the spring and summer, uh, the artificial supplements plus the in-hive sugar feeders that you have, that should help suffice, provide enough nutrition. Okay, and do you have any, so do you have any specific, like sugar syrup versus any of the sweeteners, like other syrup? Sugar syrup, sugar so, syrup for sure. Is that what you just feed, you don't feed like pro-sweet or anything like that? No, no. We buy sugar, we make syrup. And the colder the days, the concentrated the sugar syrup. Yeah, the more so that the bees have to work less for it. Do you have any idea about any of the probiotics that are out there or that people are talking about? I have actually uh, come across some uh, information on probiotics. And this is kind of like, I would say, a little fascinating as well as I'm a little uh, kind of, I would say I'm still kind of testing the waters with probiotics. For example, like even though I've worked on pesticides, I'm not against pesticides completely because, uh, you know, the societal, uh, the socioeconomic point of view is also kind of uh, important. I think I have like a similar stand for probiotics. The first, uh, I mean, when you consider a beehive, there are so many things that happen. For example, it's the adults who are actually exposed to the food. Mm -hmm. The young are kind of, they are like a second layer to the food. So when the probiotics are added, it probably possibly reaches the adult. How it is transferred to the growing brood, for me, it is still like a question which needs much detailed investigation. Okay. And what about, so the last burning question, the sterile that you're working with, 
Um, should we just all go buy buckets of it and apply it to our colonies? <laughs> no, uh, no. Uh, as I said, the synthetic source is like uh, very expensive, and we are on the only reason why we are buying the synthetic source is because we want to know how it is behaving in the bees, how much of it is important, and what effects it has. I'm hoping that in another year we will come up with. Uh, much better data as to how this sterol behaves for an entire colony and how the entire hive responds to it. I'm hoping that by the end of this year, we'll come up with much more information. And we've also developed a method for testing for about 14 different phytosterols from pollen. Not just 24 methylene cholesterol, but also uh, 14, like about 12 to 14 different phytosterols. So I will also be testing pollens constantly. And hopefully what we can do is we, once we figure out how much of it is required and what time of the year it is required and which are the plants which have abundant sources of 24 methylene cholesterol, it could also be vegetable oil because we are also going to test vegetable oil for it. Oh, so cool. anything that is feasible, cheap and easy to apply. Those are the recommendations that we are hoping to come up with in a year or so. That's great. So I will stop pestering Priya and then um, I will open it up to anybody else who might have questions. Um, I sent a, a little quick chat message to say that if anybody has any questions to send them my way, but nobody seemingly has any questions. And this is such a cool and interesting and useful I, topic. I hope, I hope I was legible. No questions always scare me. No, I had lots of questions. No, but uh, feel free also if you don't want to type, if you just wanted to unmute yourselves, um, you can do that in the on the screen directly on the um, top. So okay. I just have a question from uh, Nanette. So there's no information on which plants have the best phytosterols. Yes. This is the problem. We still don't have uh, detailed information as to which plants have the best phytosterols, which bees require. And that is why I uh, am trying to kind of collect as many different types of pollen that I possibly can. I'm also uh, encouraging people to send me pollen if they know for sure that it's the pure pollen from a plant that they know for sure, so that we don't have any misrepresentation uh, of the data sets. I am definitely going to start testing for all these samples. Like, as I said, spring, summer is crazy busy. So from fall and winter onwards, I will be testing batches of these, trying to figure out which are the best plants for uh, honeybees. So I, I hope everybody can hear me, but um, I think, so you mentioned if you have, uh, if people can send you pollen samples, if they mm -hmm. know the source of the plant. Correct. Would you be, you wouldn't be able to um, identify the plants by pollen? I know that you need a good source um, or Yes, I mean, sample, yes. So we would, I um, mean, for us, it would be easier if we already know what source it is from, mm -hmm. we can identify the sterile profile then. I can test the pollen for uh, an entire sterile profile. But if we don't know what source that uh, pollen is from, then we need to find a botanist who is an expert in pollen, and then we need to figure out and identify the pollen. So it is not uh, difficult, but it will probably take longer. It will definitely take longer. Okay, so everybody heard you can send your buckets of pollen to Priya. <laughs> I don't need a no. bucket, maybe what just like a are. tiny amount should suffice. But if you do, if you are interested in this, sounds like Priya might be um, able to find good use for if you have pollen. So if you have, you know, if you can uh, collect pollen and send it to her. And also I see Mike said, um, encourage as many people as possible to plant and grow good clean forage. And I completely agree. And I, Absolutely. Think, sort of, yeah, and I think this is where the whole community is sort of pushing towards, um, including Project Data Sam, the state beekeepers, a lot of um, associations, beekeeper associations across the country. So Absolutely. I'm definitely always talking about need for clean forage. Absolutely. Okay. I just saw a comment from Terry. I will not mind if you have like a bunch of questions and you want to like shoot me an email or I don't know, call me later or whichever is easier. That sounds perfect. Us. Bria, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
this is Mike Vigo. Um, in terms Hi. of sending, in terms of sending you pollen, mm -hmm. uh, I am no I am no uh, gardener or pollen expert, but for those of us that live in urban suburban areas, mm -hmm. uh, my bee yard is on about two or three acres of an old golf range, which is now taken over by um, star thistle. So when oh. that comes into bloom, okay. can I assume that that pollen coming in, if I collect that as star thistle and send it your way? Oh, perfect. That would be terrific. Thank you so much. But it could be mixed in with who knows what, because I'm in that urban. But, you know, I mean, it would primarily be star thistle, I would assume. Yeah, I would so to, uh, just to interject, would it help if Mike maybe cut off some uh, star thistle with pollen on it? Actually, it, could be, actually it would be better. Yeah. You know, those uh, lunch, those brown lunch bags, they absorb a lot of uh, moisture from uh, the pollen. And I don't want it to be like something that mandatorily you have to do it or, you know, I mean, it's just something voluntary. Like it would only help us build a sterile profile of any, as, of as many plants as we can. But if you can just, you know, like a tiny little box, as many flowers as you can in those brown paper bags, just like a little tiny block of dry ice and just send it our way. I will freeze it and I will work on it. Uh, okay, so a, ba a bag of, I'll give you all the star thistle you want. Thank you so much. A, bra a brown paper bag with dry ice, is that what you said? Yes, a brown paper bag, but ideally if you have dry ice, I mean, if you can possibly, then it actually helps preserve the pollen without it decaying. Because it's a like it's a tissue eventually. I mean, it would decay. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll get your address from yourself um, or Alina or somebody. And um, that stuff comes into bloom in June typically. Thank you so much. Uh, I I will really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Perfect. And I think there was a, another quick question. If uh, I know Joe has already sort of answered that, but. Um, uh, let's see, Joan asked, where, what if there's known pesticides used nearby, should we still send pollen? If you possibly can, and it is convenient, as I said before, it's like completely voluntary, but if you still possibly can, yes, because we are not testing for pesticides, we are only looking at the sterile profile. So if we know what the plant has, we can figure out a way of making sure to provide cleaner forage of the same plant. So. Priya, do you know, do, are there any effects potentially of pesticides um, interfering with sterile production? Not at the moment that I know okay. of. Neonics, which are, I would assume, most commonly used here, usually do not interfere with uh, pollen nutrition. Okay. And Priya, at, at, yes. the, at the California State Beekeepers Convention in November, one of your colleagues, and I, I apologize, I forget his name, he, he, I don't know, he didn't do this, this exact presentation, but it was uh huh. Ramesh Sagili, I would assume. Ramesh, right. And, um, but my, if you could tell everybody, because I found it to be ungodly, the cost of the 24, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> 24 methylene cholesterol? Yeah. The, uh, the synthetic <laughs> cost of it is absolutely insane, correct? Yes, it is absolutely insane. I did not want to scare people away from the webinar. So, uh, at so there are like two versions of it, right? Both of them are synthetic. The unlabeled molecule, about 250 milligrams, cost close to $10,000. And for the labeled product, which is 13C, stable, isotopically labeled, that costs about uh, 25 milligrams for $15,000. Well, if this stuff is really that great, that price is going to go up. Yes, but we are really hoping that, you know, I mean, we are working with another company for a cheaper source. We are also working with a chemist here in OSU who can provide us like less expensive source of 24 methylene cholesterol for us to conduct our studies. But we are definitely hoping for cheaper natural alternate sources. But yes, I am glad that we have this additional funding from uh, both California State Beekeepers Association and PAM for our summer experiments. So we need 15 grams of the product to run our summer studies. Wow. Hmm. So yes, I can't imagine. So Holly has a technical question. Mm -hmm. How much of the 24 methylene cholesterol do you use in your lab then? So considering uh, the crisis. <laughs> yes. Uh, so last year, the studies that we did, as I said, we had 
uh, five different concentrations, 0.1%, 0.25%, 0.5%, 0.75%, and 1%. Mm -hmm. So we used a gradation of these concentrations. Uh, and these are all percent dry diet weight of 24 methylene cholesterol. Because uh, we were not sure what to look for. If the bees even preferred 24 methylene cholesterol or if there was a difference in their consumption. That is why we started at that. And then when we found out what was happening, the next batch of studies that we did, we used 0.25%. Because from then on, we actually started seeing some changes. Does that answer your question, Holly? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> but I think we're going to end here because it is 8 o'clock. Um, and I don't want to keep anybody away from their dinner or their families. And definitely not you, Priya, since I see you're still at the office. So... Now you can go home. Uh, I'm actually, I'm going to use this uh, day as an excuse to go home early. I'm usually stuck here through nine. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> so thank you again, Priya. We really thank you everybody it. so this much. Great. Yes. Thank you, Nanette. I just saw your text. Thank you for uh, kind of like sending me some pollen if possible. Please, as I said before, this is completely voluntary. If you really help us with it, it will help us in building a sterile profile of all, you know, the available plants that we can think of. And I think that would be really useful. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us. And as I said, um, we're going to have this recording um, on eventually, as soon as I figure out how to maybe cut off some of the stuff that